Uh, another way of looking at how much we've improved, when we first started doing a five-day forecast, this was Hurricane Isabel. The white line represents our, our likelihood of where the center would be uh, at the 67% level. That means one out of three is still going to be outside of that somewhere in the forecast. At that time with Isabel, the people, the decision makers from Jacksonville, Florida to South Jersey had to be concerned about would the center pass over them. On the same skill we have now for the same storm, now you're down to Myrtle Beach to Virginia Beach. And that's why it's important that we keep improving the track forecast so our confidence can be conveyed to your officials, their confidence can be conveyed to you, and get better response in case of an evacuation. So the cone. The cone represents only the most likely area that the center of the hurricane will pass. It tells you nothing about the wind impacts. A cone forecast for, for Tropical Storm Allison is no different than a cone's forecast for Ike. See what I mean? Doesn't tell you anything about the winds. Tells you nothing about storm surge, nothing about the rainfall or the flooding, and nothing about the tornado impacts. But it does tell you that very important first key is where's the storm going to be? That is what we build the rest of our forecast off of as far as the impacts. Uh, Tropical storm uh, Ermine actually formed down originally in the eastern Pacific as a small depression and survived crossing the Isthmus of Tehuantepec into the Gulf of Mexico. And most of last season, the southern Gulf of Mexico, Bay of Campeche, was prime territory. Everything was ripe down there for development. Everything that went through there intensified. Ermine almost made it to a hurricane before running into land again in northeast uh, Mexico, this time a little closer to Brownsville. And this time it produced tornadoes way far away from the center. This was up uh, between Corsicana and Dallas where these tornadoes occurred. The threat for tornadoes is something that needs to be taken into a, the, the outside effects of a storm, not just tornadoes, but the heavy rain is something you need to be aware of. Uh, the, the standard precautions, just like with any tornadoes, uh, get to a safe place inside the interior of your house. Uh, same thing with flooding. It goes away. Don't take your chances and drive in it. Turn around, don't drown if you're out in it. And this is a case where Ermine came inland pretty fast. We had flooding rains from San Antonio to Austin. I know in this drought it's hard to believe. Not even a year ago we had flooding rains somewhere, but we did. The next night we had flooding rains in Oklahoma. Uh, the next day, they had spotty flooding rains in southern Illinois and, and in, uh, in Kentucky. The inland effects of these can go amazingly far inland because of the, uh, the high volume of moisture that's in the atmosphere when they come in. People are surprised by the heavy rain a lot in, in tropical cyclones. The rainfall rates is generally double what you get in your typical springtime thunderstorm, which provide plenty of rain and flooding. It's just that very high rain on these flat lands, that's where you get the ponding and the flooding of your roads. Storm surge, you all remember this picture. Well, the, the red circle represents uh, what we affectionately call the last house standing. And the uh, yellow circle is there is a property belonging to a friend of mine. Now you might ask, why is the Hurricane Center director a friend with someone that let him build his house on a sandbar? Well, my friend is a risk taker. This guy is a tide expert. You'd think he'd know better. He does. He's willing to take the risk. He understands what he's getting into. He was nowhere near there when I came in. Well, his house uh, was 10 miles uh, west of there, somewhere in Chambers County. And that's what he and his wife, uh, uh, taking it all in stride, sitting in a couple of lawn chairs uh, where, where their land existed. And then they rebuilt. And just like Neil Frank said for 30 years after he was director of the Hurricane Center, one of the most common things we see after a hurricane wipes a beachfront out, we rebuild and we rebuild more expensively. We say we rebuild better, but the operative word is more expensively. I'm not as uh, polite sometimes as Neil, so I'm snarky about it and I say, we set the table with juicier hurricane bait. Now that house is, 12 feet, is eight feet higher, but guess what? Ike wasn't the worst case scenario for there. You can get higher surge and you can get higher waves. Also, the people that built in front of him, especially the front row of houses, when they fall down and that debris moving and fast moving water hits your nice new house on stilts, it's going to take it out. It happens. The odds may be, he's added to his protection as far as risk, 
He understands it. He won't be there when there's a storm. Okay, uh, storm surge as we did it for the first 30 years that we could graphically do it looked like this. And people thought, wow, the storm surge keeps getting higher and higher as you go inland. Well, that's a reference against what's called datum. How many of you in here know what NGVD 88 is? It, not fair, Gene, you're not allowed to. This is an engineering town, and I saw one hand other than Gene Haffel's go up. Uh, and I couldn't, it took me all my life to convince the guys that did this model for us is, fellas, your science is impeccable, but no one understands what the heck you're doing. We need to show them how deep the water is over land. So all we've really done is estimate the average height of each grid box in that model and subtract out the land elevation. And instead of looking at this and saying it's going to be 30 feet of water over the properties on the ship channel, we look at this and it says it's going to be somewhere two to five feet over the ship channel. And oh, by the way, this is a storm moving into the west side of, or move, this would be a worst case storm of category four moving north, northwest. In other words, if Rita had done what we thought it was gonna do, this is what you would have seen for inundation somewhere from Galveston County uh, uh, eastward. All the Clear Lake area, the house I used to have would have had nine feet of water in it in South Shore on this prediction. It's not a category five, it's not a worst case scenario. There are worst case scenarios. You need to be aware of those. You can't change it, it's not gonna go away. You can try to engineer your way around it, but no one's gonna pay for it, so that's not gonna happen. You need to be aware of it, buy your insurance, and get out of harm's way when you're told to do so. If you live further down the coast, the same thing, another example, since we are talking uh, Carla these days, <clears throat> where you see the pinks and reds going up there in Jackson County, is where the highest surge went in Carla, uh, and it was 22 and change, I believe, up in there. Uh, but what it really meant over land was something like this, several feet. Uh, Port O'Connor, Palacios, Matagorda, those towns were devastated by storm surge, even though the absolute height of the water wasn't as high above sea level as further inland, the height of the water over the ground was. I've been told no one can see this graph, so I'll just say this is a a graph of Hurricane Felix, and the colored lines on there represent our best forecasts of intensity. Uh, the black line is what Felix actually did. Uh, the time is on the bottom and the wind speed on the top. Uh, at the start of that graph, Felix was a 35-knot tropical storm. Pretend for the moment, if you will, that Felix is in the Bay of Campeche, forecast to move north and impact Houston in 48 hours. My best models forecast 60 knots of wind. I forecast 60 knots of wind to be on the safe side. We add, a, add another 20 knots. We're forecasting an 80 knot uh, storm coming ashore in 48 hours on the coast at Galveston. How many of you think an evacuation will be called for at that time? Good answer, it won't be. Not at 48 hours at the expectations, uh, you're not looking at a full scale evacuation. Okay, storm moves north. 24 hours later, it's now a 65 knot category one hurricane. 24 hours from landfall, we're now forecasting it to be a 90-knot hurricane at landfall. Guess what? It's too late. You need 48 hours. And guess what? It doesn't stop at 90, it goes to 145. And guess what? I don't know how to forecast that at 48 hours. Never had, but I won't say never will. We're making very good progress in the modeling of it. We may actually have cracked some ideas on the theory if we can just keep our, uh, our scientists funded enough in the universities to continue that research. In five to 10 years, I think we'll have improved that forecast. But even then, it's gonna be a tough call because people don't wanna deal with something that's only a tropical storm, it's forecast to be a big hurricane. They wanna wait and see for themselves, corroborate what that evidence is on the hurricane. Uh, my biggest nightmare are rapid developers in the Gulf. So you say, ah, you're, 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 you're just blowing smoke, fear-mongering, never happens, right? Remember Umberto a couple of years ago? Give me 18 more hours, I would have had a major hurricane the way it was intensifying. It went from nothing to a hurricane in 18 hours and then back to nothing again. And the, the chart with nothing on it, on the right side, that was the probability statistical probability based on our forecast of observing hurricane force winds. Zero. That's a, it's a measure of our skill and unfortunately that's where the science is right now. It's like demanding a cure for a certain kind of cancer for which there is one. We're working on it but we don't have it yet. 
And this rather scary chart represents any storm that came through the Gulf and then rapidly intensified to a major hurricane before hitting land. There's a lot of them in there. In fact, almost every storm that has had a major impact in the Gulf of Mexico went through a rapid intensification while in the Gulf of Mexico. Change gears a little bit. Heavy rain. Ten years ago, at this time, one of my forecasters is getting water in his house in Santa Fe in Galveston County because the brush and overgrowth and their uh, drainage dish was, it made a, a bit of a dam and the water from the rain had backed up on his, on his house. Four days later, almost everyone in this city had Allison stories and I find it hard to believe it's only been 10 years. How many of you have flood insurance? That's about twice as many as any other audience I talked to around the country. In fact, a lot of places that had ramped up some flood insurance after events, it went back down. Uh, flood insurance is not just for those in the 100 year floodplain. If you live in Houston, I guarantee you you're in some kind of a floodplain. I'm on one of the highest pieces of land in Galveston County, and I have flood insurance. The higher you up you are, the cheaper it is, up to a point. So uh, don't take a risk on that. We get these incredible rains here, and no matter how well we try to engineer and build and upgrade where the properties are built, uh, Mother Nature has a curve that's a little bit beyond what we engineer to. And Allison was not just prolific here. We, we were so busy with our own problems, we didn't realize that there was actually more rain in southern and southeast Louisiana than there was here. All in all, over 50 people lost their lives, and it's in the top 30 most costly storms to ever hit the United States. The only one that's a tropical storm. Uh, we're on Facebook, sports fans, uh, those that like to follow us on Facebook. Uh, what you'll get on there, what, it's experimental for us too, the first time we've tried this, is kind of a plain language, easy to understand description at the start of the day, what's going on in the tropics. This will not be our venue for popping out the advisories every time we see it. You'll unfriend us right away if we clutter your Facebook page with all kinds of stuff. We be tweeting, sports fans, as of June 1st. Cranked out the first tweet. Now this is where you'll get uh, alerts. You're not going to be where we're at a computer all the time, much to a meteorologist uh, horror watching what the weather's doing. You've got other things to do. How many of you know, just raise your hands, what the times are that we actually issue our forecasts? See? My forecasters think everybody knows what time we issue our forecasts. Why? You don't need to. You go online, you watch TV, you watch the Weather Channel, you can get a forecast. You don't care what time it came out, you just want the latest information. But what this will do is pop to you, a new information is out on Tropical Storm Arlene, or a new outlook has just been issued. If it's important to you at the time, you can stop what you're doing and look at it. That's the point of that. Uh, you all want to know the seasonal forecast? This is NOAA's forecast. 12 to 18 named storms, 6 to 10 of which would be hurricanes, 3 to 6 major. Uh, that's, again, way above long-term averages, and it would be on the high side of the active period we're having now. Centerpoint Energy, always there.